just to give uh, a bit of a background to uh, this uh, project, Intractable Problems of uh, Human Rights. Um, we recognize that there's a number of really tough um, issues of uh, human rights where there's been significant uh, regulation. Uh, we have uh, excellent uh, normative frameworks and yet um, the enjoyment uh, of the rights that are promised uh, in these normative frameworks are not realized for uh, a great uh, number of our uh, brothers and sisters. Um, uh, there's a couple of uh, examples. Uh, if you look, for example, at the um, international frameworks for uh, anti-racism, uh, these are really, really strong. Uh, we have um, a whole gamut of um, protections, uh, both at the international level, but also the regional level. Uh, human trafficking is another, where you have significant um, protection on paper, child labor, uh, but also protection of um, uh, LGBTQI plus uh, minorities. And the question uh, that we are looking at uh, uh, in the project is, uh, what do we need to do further in order to uh, realize the promise of the law? Because we conclude that the law is not enough. It's not sufficient to pass uh, laws uh, or pass more laws uh, when um, it's clear that these uh, will not will not will not work. Um, and so, uh, we have put together uh, a multidisciplinary team uh, of researchers uh, coming from different uh, traditions, uh, from the law, from philosophy, from um, you know uh, the other social sciences. Try and think of more um, innovative ways uh, that could allow us to uh, realize, uh, you know, what on paper look like really uh, awesome protections. And we hope with these kinds of conversation, perhaps we can uh, reimagine uh, a world where we have better protection of human rights. So with those few words, I welcome all of you uh, to this talk and uh, to thank you especially, uh, Pamela, uh, for making the time uh, to share the wisdoms you've collected uh, over the years with us so uh, that, you know, we aim for that better protection. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much. I was saying thank you, Prof, for that background to, to the project. Uh, Pamela uh, is a filmmaker and an LGBTQI rights advocate. She has dedicated her life to advocating and telling stories of African lesbians, bisexual, and queer women through visual storytelling. She is also a communication professional who is passionate about her physical fitness. She lives in Lagos, Nigeria, with her poor baby, Miji. Have, have I uh, pronounced the last name properly? Um, my, my last name? And, uh, no, but it's, it's fine. It's okay. No okay, thank you so much. Uh, so today we will have her to give her thoughts about what she has been doing as Prof has uh, indicated. So Pamela, the, the floor is yours. Can, let's, let's engage with you in that manner. Okay, um, thank you, Gifts. Thank you everyone for inviting me. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and um, I think that this conversation is so important, um, you know, just not just because of the topic, but because of the things that are happening around the world, you know, given the global context of um, the LGBT rights and, and just human rights in general. Um, and, and so that's why when Mitch reached out to me to ask, you know, I was like, okay, this is um, very important because 
I've like in 2022, I've pretty much scaled back on a lot of public speaking because um, I just felt like I needed to give other people the opportunity to also speak. You know, let's let's hear different uh, perspectives, different um views on 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 these issues so but anyway but i'm happy to be here thank you so much for inviting me i think i will go ahead now and share my screen um just so we're on the same page I'll do that right now okay for the time being um so today i'm going to be talking about storytelling and using storytelling as a tool for um, social change, social inclusion of um, LGBT people. And not just, I mean, this doesn't, my, my focus today is on, is on the queer community, but it doesn't necessarily have to be just the queer community, right? So storytelling could be used as a tool um, to do so many other, other things because um, in my experience and in many other people's experiences, um, you know, it's, I mean, the, the data is important, it's important to quote the data, to, to have the data, you know, but sometimes when you're able to speak, um, when you're able to translate that data into people's stories, um, it is sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's able to go uh, much deeper. Your, your, your message is, is uh, more conveyed in a, in a much more powerful way. So, um, so yeah, so that's what we're going to be talking about today and how storytelling can bridge the gap between law and society. So what is it that the law says and where is society at? And, you know, what needs to happen um, in order to make society and law sort of like match and make sure that it, it's caring for, for the most vulnerable in, in society. So this is just an outline of the things, the, um, how the conversation is going to go. Um, I'm I'm hearing that there's that there's a uh, sort of um, how do I say this now? That the, the focus um, people want to really know about like lived experiences and how you know lived experiences are really um, how LGBT people are living in Nigeria. Um, and so I'll touch on a few things, um, and then we'll have like you know I'll give my own reflection on what I think. Um, you know, based on the, on the presentation and then open up the floor for question and answer. All right, so um, when people ask me to introduce myself, I usually struggle and I struggle because uh, I wear many hats, um, but uh, I like to think of myself as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, um, a communications professional. I'm also a public speaker, I train people um, I like to work out, uh, I go to the gym a lot, and I you know, just generally enjoy of life. I like to travel, I have a good time. Um, yeah, so that's, that's me in a nutshell, um, pretty much. And I don't want to focus too much on that, but yeah. All right, so I'm going to move um, on to the current state of the LGBT rights um, and lived experiences of people in Nigeria. Um, I mean, obviously, people know a lot about the Same Sex Marriage Prohibition Act and, you know, everything it, it says. Um, and it pretty much just, you know, prohibits like same sex marriage, obviously, with the 14 year jail sentence. Um, and then I think another thing too that people miss um, a lot in, in within the law is the fact that it infringes on the freedom of association. So you know there is this clause in the in the law that says you know you can't form or or, or create what they call gay organizations even if they don't really explicitly say what that means, right? But pretty much you can. They're saying that you can go to jail for like ten years if you know, you're found guilty. Um, and then it also like prohibits a moral show of same sex um, affection, which obviously is kind of silly because given the context of Nigeria and the way that Nigerians are, we are a very, very physical people, right? So we touch each other a lot. We like to hold hands and put each other's hands on each other and whatever, you know, so, I mean, I could be walking down the street with my sister and then someone could say, hey, 
it's amorous show of same sex affection, which is very silly, right? Um, so, but but that's that's what the law translates to, and that's what um, a, a lot of um, actors, state actors, and non-state actors sort of capitalize on um, when they're trying to, you know, sort of enforce the law, right? Um, and speaking of, of freedom of association, I mean, later on during this conversation, I will talk a lot more about um, about this infringement um, and how it personally affected me because I tried to register. I tried. To, I'm sorry, my dog is being silly. I tried to register an organization in 2018 um, and was denied by the um, High Court because it had you know, the L word, the word lesbian in it. And so um, I decided that I was going to take them to, to court. And we, were, we were going to finish this, this whole thing because I felt that it was discriminatory. Um, and then so we went to the high courts and the high courts um, ruled in favor of the government saying that, and, and quoting the section 10 of the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act, um, and so the case is now in the appeal court, but it's, so the, the, the whole point of it is, is asking the courts to determine whether or not that section is constitutional or, or not, right? And so what's, what's at stake is that if we're able to succeed, then it means that um, queer organizations in Nigeria don't have to like, you know, look for, funny names or try to hide and like the nature of their work just to be able to register, you know, like and be able to register as we are and say what we do and all of that. So um I mean the yeah this is this is pretty much like the gist of the act of the law. Um and I'm sure if you Google it, you can see it it's in its entirety and you can read it. Um, but that's that's pretty much what it says, right? And I felt that it was important for me to highlight that at the beginning because um, the SSMP um, is responsible for shaping a lot of the ex lived experiences of queer people um, in, in Nigeria. And then the other thing that I wanted to touch on is, um, the Human Rights Violations Report, um, which was uh, compiled by the Initiative for Equal Rights. And so they do this um, violations report every year. So the latest one is 2021. And um, for me, I mean, um, you know, going through these statistics and seeing the way, seeing, seeing the, the nature of the violations, you know, from arbitrary arrest to, to sexual violence to imprisonment, extortion, black. But I mean, there, there are a lot of stories about people who have been ketoed. So ketoed is a term we use in Nigeria for um, black male. So, you know, somebody poses as something that they're not, and then they kind of lure you into a particular place, maybe a hotel room or somewhere else and then they sort of blackmail you right so they say if you don't give us this money we're going to tell the whole world that you're gay and blah 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 and they're going to arrest you and and so people have fallen victim to to these kinds of things um a lot in nigeria and um as you can see the numbers support um these violations um i i mean personally i I haven't um, experienced any of, of these, but I, I know that there are people who who have, um, people who have been arrested because someone, because the police officer said, oh, you look gay, or you're dressing like a woman, or you're dressing like a, you know, um, and, and people have lost money, people have been, have been thrown in jail, um, most times with no representation, uh, just because someone thinks that you look gay, right? Like, what what does that even mean? How does someone look gay? And who determines who looks gay and who doesn't look gay, right? So what are the parameters with which you measure whether somebody looks gay or not, 
right? And can you actually determine someone's sexual orientation based on their dressing, right? So these are all questions that, that um, unfortunately people that are arrested or people that, that, um, that have to face these kinds of violations don't really get answers to, right? Because nobody, you know, nobody cares. So most times if you are arrested like that and you don't have money, you know, you pretty much just stay where you are unless someone helps you or maybe an organization helps you or your family. But then a lot of people are reluctant to bring their family because it's like, okay, maybe you're closeted and they don't know that, that you're gay or whatever. And then, and, you know, when you say, oh, I need help because I was arrested, then you have to explain why you're arrested and then ABCD can happen, right? So, but I think for me, um, the one thing that is not really listed here as a violation is, um, you know, the fact that a lot of people get kicked out of their homes, you know, so let's say you, um, let's say, someone outs you to your landlord or your landlady or your or your the owner of the house, you know, and then um a lot of people have lost their their accommodation, their their homes, their some people have lost their jobs, some people have, you know, been kicked out of their family homes. You know, so so it's for me, um, you know, even even though you know, it's those things are not more, not really listed here, but I feel like they speak a lot more to to what these violations are because I I don't feel like people need to choose between their families and who they are or their jobs and who they are. You know, having to put people in a position where you have to pick between your next meal and your you know and being being your, your yourself or whatever you know so. For me, um, that's like a, a huge thing. Um, you know, I remember when I came out of the closet, when I came out to my my parents, my mom in particular, um, she asked me to move out of our family house, right? So I was almost homeless at, at some point, but my dad intervened and said, no, you're not going anywhere. Um, so I, I know how, how that feels like for you to face the reality that, oh my God, like I can be homeless, you know? Um, but yeah, but that's, that's, um, that's what a lot of people, um, face here. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is just like a depiction of, um, you know, um, the violations, um, from 2021 from the auditions reports and you can see the I think the interesting thing about this is the number of non-state actors so people who are just acting on their own not necessarily like police people or, or law enforcement folks or anything um you can see the, the discrepancy you know 424 as opposed to 61 state actors um yeah and you can see how you know, how the numbers shape up and it's largely targeted at men, you know. Um and even even in a in a, in a place like Nigeria where it's well anyway, I, I think that patriarchy, the fact that that Nigeria is a very patriarchal society also plays into this fact that men, gay men are usually um like a huge target of homophobia, of blackmail, of um um, what you call it, um, arbitrary arrests, because it's like, oh, why are you dressing like a woman? Why are you talking like a woman? Why are you walk like a woman? As if it's it's sort of like a crime to to be a, a woman or to 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 be associated with anything womanly, right? Um, but anyway, but yeah, so these these are the numbers. This is this is where we are um, in terms of what was reported in twenty twenty one. Um, yeah, another thing too that um, sort of that a lot of queer people experienced and which I also experienced um, is this conversion and I put it in quotation because there is actually no conversion going on, right? In my opinion, it's just like abuse, 
right? It's like torture. So I put it in quotation marks because, yeah, I don't really, I don't think there's no evidence that suggests that um, people can be cured of, of their sexual orientation or, or gender identity or anything like, like that. Um, so again, I'll go back to my personal story, right? So when I came out, um, I think this was, you know, maybe, yeah, I think a year after I came out to my my family, um, my my mom was very. It was very, the whole thing was really hard on on her. She had a hard time accepting that okay, um, I was I'm, I'm lesbian because I was actually married, right? So I used to be married to this to this guy, um, and so she had so I had left the marriage, and then here I was saying that oh by the way I'm lesbian, you know, <laughs> um, so it was kind of hard for her to accept. And um, so she felt that it was something that could be cured. You know, maybe I was, I was maybe under some kind of spell or, or spiritual attack. And so she went to this uh, spiritual house and they gave her like a concoction um, to bring back home. And everybody in the house was supposed to drink this thing and pray twice a day. And when we drink it, you know, just like a, like this ritual, you know, and and they the the belief, which is what they told her, was that I was under some kind of spiritual attack, right? So um, yes, so so I mean, I I didn't drink it, and that caused a lot of friction, you know, within within the family because um, my my mom kind of felt like I was not willing to change right and she couldn't really understand that so anyway um so there was there was a study that was done um again by tears the initiative for equal rights um looking at the impact um and the occurrence of um of um you know conversion therapy in in nigeria and as my story as you just heard from my very short story the major initiators are parents, right? So you find that your, your child is gay or queer or, or anything, and then, you know, you feel like, oh my God, you know, the general notion is this is something bad. We need to pray over it, right? We need to pray this thing away and it's just going to go. So 44% um, of people that responded to the survey reported that, you know, the pressure came from their parents. Um, and then obviously where the parents turn to, right? Religious houses. Right, so pastors, imams, things like that, and um, you can see the numbers. Forty percent, um, you know, said that um, they were taken to religious houses, and even for me, even after the the whole thing with drinking the concoction, and and I mean, I, I didn't drink it, but you know, like the fact that my mom brought it home, and this was like a thing. Um, she still took me to to see a pastor for therapy <laughs> or counseling, as she as she put it. And you know, I was given many books to read about how to change and how to be focused on God and how God can cure me and all of this stuff, you know. Um. So, so I have experienced these things um personally, um. Then uh, I think another thing too that was really, really important is the fact that in, in this whole data um, is just the way that people, um, the, the kind of methods that, that people use, you know, um, sorry, I said rulers here. I actually meant to say healers. That was a mistake, sorry about that. Um, but sometimes, you know, people are taken to traditional healers and they use the, you know, different methods, they stop you, they make marks on the body, they flog you. I mean, I've seen a lot of people, you know, just, you don't even need to go far in Lagos, and you know, just go to, to the beach at, at night or something, or um, sometime, you know, in the evening when the sun is down. And a lot of people, you know, are there, well, some people are there to, you know, to you know, uh, perform rituals and things, and then the other people who are there because they feel like they have a 
they have the spirit of homosexuality <laughs> and that is you know that has um, overpowered them and so they, they want to exor exercise those demons you know so they flood you they beat you they you know they keep you in a place for a while you don't eat you know and then some people or some victims are also sexually abused so they, they say they have to have sex with you so that these demons can leave you you know and a lot of um, religious healers and religious leaders take advantage of these these situations to abuse victims you know so people come to you and they really believe in their mind that you can cure them and then you take advantage of them and sexually abuse them you know it, it was such a big thing that occurred that um showed up in the in the research and obviously i mean you can't um expose a person to all of these inhumane and torturous practices and then expect that they will just everything will be okay you know so a lot of people will suffer you know um depression for a long time people don't understand what's happening to, to them people are anxious you know they feel kind of guilty about okay maybe this is all my fault you know can you imagine like the mental trauma like mental impact you know that, that these kinds of things can can have on on a, on a person you know and there's like no evidence no medical research like nothing there's nothing to, to support the fact that these things work in fact the world health organization you know has said um, conversion therapy practices must be um must be um stopped and that the amount of torture and, and things like that so so but but the the reality is that a lot of people here in nigeria and i think in most parts of africa especially the countries i've been to really really believe that these things work i mean you you know there are stories of you know imams and, and priests and traditional healers saying oh they are here to they are here they are put on the earth to cure people to help them some people say oh if you know you have to love love the sinner but hate the sin and receive people with love and then they can change you know there is a wide spread belief that people can actually change their sexual orientation you know or their gender identity and whereas there is no evidence to suggest that so well that's where we are now um in Nigeria. Um, okay. And this is a picture of, um, this is the late T.B. Joshua, um, who used to, he's very known for conducting um, this so-called prayer healing sessions where you're delivered from homosexuality. <laughs> And all of that. And the funny thing about this story is I know the person in white. Like that's someone that I know personally. And I also know that um this whole arrangement here was a paid arrangement. You know, they weren't they actually paid them to 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 act like they were they were cured, you know, like you know, so so these kinds of things happen also where you know, or maybe the the pastor or the imam or whoever wants to use your story or use you to kind of gain followership or to feel to make people feel like they are more powerful than they actually are, and then they arrange for you or for people to come and act like okay, I'm gonna uh, okay, I've been killed now, and then they pay them, you know, and that was the case here, and that's why I picked this picture because this is. This is something that I know personally is first hand information. This is not I heard from somewhere else, you know. Um, so yeah, these kinds of things are very common and happening every day in Nigeria. Um, okay, so I mean now that we know about you know kind of what's you know like the, the violations and 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 you know, how the kinds of things people have to deal with, some of the kinds of things people have to deal with. Um, I wanted to also talk about the social perception study. So this study 
um, just really measures the way people view homosexuality and um, queer people in Nigeria. And it's done every two years by the Initiative for Equal Rights. Um, and what's so interesting about this study for me, so the last one was done in 20, 2019, and then obviously COVID happened and everything just kind of went off. <laughs> so uh, um, the next one is coming out this year, but this is the latest one. And one of the things that really, really struck me about this is just is the way that perceptions are changing, the way that people's attitudes are shifting. And, and it begs the question, so what's responsible for these shifts, right? So what's making people, um, you know, Know, change their attitudes or change their minds towards towards the queer community. You know, is it is it uh, is it that just with the passage of time, people just kind of feel like, ah, yeah, 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 or you know, what what exactly is driving this? And I'll touch a little bit on what I believe is driving it um, soon. But let me just go through through what the numbers say. Um, so you can see that a lot of people. Um, believe that that um, sorry no I think there's an error there X nine percent do not believe that homosexuality is in it um, that's that's the right thing um, and five people believe that it is and six uh, sorry five percent believe that it is and six percent are unsure about whether it's in it or not. And I think that this feeds again into some of the beliefs that people have that I spoke about earlier. Um, you know, even with my own family, with my own parents, you know, um, this belief that you weren't born this way, that this is sort of like a learned behavior or something that you picked up from somewhere and, you know, it can be gotten rid of. But you can see the way that these real life experiences are reflected in the data, right? And another thing too is um, something that really struck me is the fact that in 2015, you know, only 11% of people that were surveyed, which was, you know, 11% um, of about 4,000 people or so from all over Nigeria, you only 11% said they were willing to accept a family member who's uh, homosexual, so who's, who's queer, right? who's not heterosexual. And then in 2019, that number grew to 30%. So what happened between 2015 and 2019? I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's a big jump. We would like for it to be bigger, but this is where we are now. Um, but so what 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 happened? What happened between 2015 and 2019 um, that led to this increase? Well, I'll touch on that also um, shortly. And then obviously the support for the Same Sex Marriage Prohibition Act, you know, dropped a few points um, from 87 in 2015 to 75 in 2019. Another thing that was very interesting is. Um, 29% say, you know, they know a famous person who's homosexual, but uh, I think only about um, two or 3% said they know a family member who's homosexual, which is something that struck me because I know for a fact that a lot of gay people in Nigeria like plain C, <laughs> right? But you don't see, I, I don't know. I I think, I think the, the, the negative perception, the, the um, what do you call it now? What's that word? The stigma that comes with, you know, um, saying someone or, or being queer or, you know, all of that, I think it kind of um, affects the way that people accept or admit in public that they, they have a family member who is um, queer, right? So, and I feel like that's what we're seeing here. Again, tying back into the the way that people view homosexuality in in Nigeria, even you know the way the tying back into my own lived experience, 
um, with my own family and things like that. Um, and then what's so interesting is <laughs> 70% of people who surveyed said that Nigeria will be better without queer people. And then this is very interesting because it fuels most of the human rights violations that we see um, in, in Nigeria, where a lot of it is by non-state actors, because there are people out there who really believe that, oh my God, if these gay people were not here, Nigeria would be better. You know, they are the cause of our problems. If we have flawed is the gay people. Everything is us, you know. Um, and it's kind of it's funny, but it's not really funny uh, because it it's, it really drives violence against against um, queer people here, um, physical, mental violence, you know, verbal violence, and things like that. So, um, but yeah, but that's 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 the reality. And now, obviously, if people are still feeling this way. They know you don't expect them to see yes to same sex marriage. So the the whole idea. Um, behind this is even though there's acceptance and it's kind of moving, I mean, it's moving towards acceptance and it's slow. I think for me, what's, what was really um, comforting was the fact that um, people don't seem not to really be supporting the same sex by prohibition act as much as they did before. Um, and then also another thing too is the fact that um, when it comes to awareness of queer folks in Nigeria, it seems as if people have sort of, you know, um, gone underground. So I feel like it's a mixture of both, of people not accepting family members and then also queer folks going underground, um, not being as visible, not being as open. Um, yeah, so I think I think for me those are the two things that kind of um, shape the way that the data comes out. Um, okay, so I was talking about what what um, what has happened over the last few years to lead to some of these. Um, uh, like to, to lead to the changes in the numbers where the, where the change is positive, right? And I think that, uh, yeah. And I think that, so, I mean, when you, when you look at um, even the LGBT rights organization landscape in Nigeria has changed a lot, right? So where we had like maybe one, maybe two or three major, not even major, just like LGBT rights organizations, right? In Nigeria in 2010, for instance, today we have more than, what, 20, 25? And so, um, and these organizations are not just coming up, you know, and, and being silent. So a lot of people are organizing awareness campaigns, a lot of people are, um, are organizing events more publicly. Um, so in, in times when, um, or doing, you know, like back in the day when this event would be, you know, sort of hidden. I mean, there are still hidden events, but a lot of, a lot more organizations are planning events that are more public, that are more open, you know. Um, and I, I feel like that has sort of um, increased awareness um, a lot. I also think that. Um, you know the investment in research, in creating reports, in 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 helping queer people stay safe. You know, um, just you know, developing these tools to help people to 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 cope. You know, to stay safe, to avoid risky situations, and things like that. Um, also helps in letting people know that okay, this is what you need to do. Um, I think there's also been a lot of capacity building workshops. So people, lots of organizations have invested money, donors especially have invested money into building capacity. So because there's the realization that, okay, people need to be empowered because if you have a job, if you have, if you're earning a, you know, a good income and you're able to care for yourself, your 
less susceptible to to manipulation of, from your from your family, right? So your family can tell you, oh, you know, you, you must do A, B, C, D, E, unless you are kind of dependent on them for for survival. Then of course they will tell you what you should do. But if you are if you're able to care for yourself and you're in, independent of them, then you have a bit of leverage in terms of what you do and and things like that. So so there's lots of um, economic empowerment workshops going on, people learning skills, um, you know, people learning, learning, you know, um, trades or going to going to school or even just being empowered in, in like writing a resume or, you know, or getting and keeping a job, things like that. Um, a lot of those things are um, happening. Um, I think another thing too that is that really really strikes me is the way that this younger generation has found a way to build communities. So in the past, where people had to hide um, and talk about things like this, now people can talk about them on Twitter, right? And people can put like, you know, the, the LGBT flag on their profile, you know, and and you find that there are lots of um, spaces um, online, like you know, a, a Twitter space or Facebook groups, private groups, you know, that queer people organize. I know I'm a member of about two of them, um, two Nigerian um, uh, groups, you know, where, you know, let's say LBQ women just are together. We talk about different things. We share um share resources, you know, share people's networks, you know, just a way to build like a, a community of support, you know, because to be honest, like it's really hard for queer people in Nigeria, you know, and just to have that space where you can go to and like vent and talk and feel free without having to worry that, you know, you might implicate yourself somewhere or you know your family finding out or something else happening to you um, is is really important for a lot of people and I know when I came out of the closet I didn't have that because at the time which was in 2012 um yeah, there wasn't really, there weren't really a lot of um, these spaces. I didn't really know, like, a lot of Nigerian queer women in particular, um, or even gay men. I didn't really know a lot, there was like maybe one or two. So, but just to watch the way that all of these things have sort of grown over time, for me, I feel like it's telling of the movement, of the growth of the movement. And it's just a really, really good thing that's happening because it's helping a lot of people. And I think that that is so important. Um, another thing too that has happened is, so we've sort of seen a, a um, I don't want to call it sporadic, but it's it kind of stays that way because it just sort of exploded, right? Where we have like quite content, like a lot of people are, I mean, whether it's podcasts or, or documentaries or like, you know, series or movies, you know, we've had quite a few of them, um, obviously spearheaded by the Initiative for Equal Rights, but, you know, um, and, and that organization, um, you know, they in the past, they've sort of made movies about um, gay men. So they focused a lot on gay men, um, which also leaves a wide opening for, for women, so it's like, okay, well, where do we fit in this in this whole story? For me, that was a thing that I, I, I um, that was that's the thing that was really on my mind when I decided to, um, you know, go into storytelling and using film as as a tool for for that. Um, so this is just, uh, I just wanted to touch on this, but I think I've pretty much covered everything that I've said here already. Um, if people have questions, we can definitely go back to it. But yeah, so so why storytelling? Why 
why is it important for us to be represented? Because when you have representation, it normalizes lived experiences, right? So, I mean, how many times have we seen ourselves in movies or seen people that look like us in movies and, and we can really identify, like we can really say, wow, this is someone that looks like me. This is someone that's acting like me. This is a story that I can relate to, right? And so um, because there was that gap in telling stories of LBQ women, the Equality Hub decided to do to produce this film called Ife. Ife means love in Yoruba um, language. And um, another thing that really inspired us was the fact that, I mean, another thing that inspired us to use film is the fact that, you know, film is very influential, very powerful, you know, because it, it not only has the power to show you the reality or to kind of tell you how things are now, but it can give you a future to imagine. Right, so you if if you if you've never thought about something and you see it in film, it opens your your mind. You say, ah, but wait too, like you know, this is actually possible. But just to show you, like a bit of what um if I is about. So if I is really about um you know two women, uh, Adora and if I, um who um sort of bond, they fall in love over a three day date. And um, you know, within the course of that that date, um, a kind of secret, not really secret, but they learn something about each other, and and it threatens their their love, pretty much. And so, um, the whole point of the movie was to was to sort of bring more LBQ representation to the fore, um, and to really, um, you know create a story and create a film that was very, very relatable for queer people, especially LBQ women in, in Nigeria, to, to give more accurate and positive representation of, of our lived experiences, of our love, of, of just us, you know. And um, it, it's the first film of its kind um, coming from Nigeria. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's just been receiving a lot of um, international, um, uh, it, the, the, the reception has been very positive um, from all over, all over the, the world. And um, another thing that we uh, produced was Under the Rainbow, um, which is a feature length documentary. Um, and it pretty much just, you know, talks about, you know, my coming out story and, and things like that. And the Initiative for Equal Rights has also produced, um, um, I think they've, they've done uh, quite a few. So they've done Walking with Shadows, Hello High Water, We Don't Live Here Anymore. Um, and all of these films are, are all focused on telling stories about queer people. Um, and so, yeah, it's available to, to be watched on, uh, so the Equality Hub has a streaming platform called the EHTV Network, um, where you can stream these movies. Um, yeah, so the the picture on the left is a picture from um, from Walking with Shadows, um, and then that's the poster for Under the Rainbow. Um, okay, so. Uh, I, I don't know if, I don't know, I feel like I've, I've talked a lot and I'm, although there's a Q&A session, but I just, I feel like, I don't know, maybe people have questions or not, but uh, anyway, let me just um, continue. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that, um, I mean, it's very clear, obviously, that a lot of the problems, a lot of, um, um, what's the word? A lot of negative experiences that queer people experience in, in Nigeria is really, really, is fueled by the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act and also by um, perceptions about queer people and um, yeah. 
and um, and also religious um, beliefs, right? And so I I feel like even though nobody has been jailed as a result of the of this law, it's still it's still giving um, impetus to a lot of people to act on their own. And it's a very big problem because as, as I've explained to you, a, a lot of the um, issues that queer people face are from non-state actors and not even from law enforcement people. Uh, so, you know, how about somebody living somewhere in, maybe somewhere in the, you know, um, maybe someone that doesn't live in a gated estate or, or someone that has to live in kind of like this community style arrangement where, you know, someone can only break into your house and say, hey, come and see you. And then next thing, people are beating you and all of that, you know? Yeah, those are, those are things that people are experiencing, you know? So, and all of those are fueled by the fact that they feel that they're not doing anything wrong, that they're doing what the law says. Right, even though most people have never read the law, but that's conversation for another day. Right. Um, I also feel that, I mean, this is still like a very um, controversial topic, but I feel like there needs to be some kind of um, education or infusion of soji topics into academic curriculums because if you have people from different, I mean, people that are in, in leadership positions, when you speak about um, when I spiritual leaders or you have like, you know, doctors, uh, you know, people, you know, nurses that really believe that, that, you know, are pretty much clueless, pretty much about surgery topics, you know, that, that don't really understand the concept of sexual orientation, what it, what it is, that think that homosexuality is something that needs to be cured, that feel like they are doing you a service <laughs> by by maltreating you or by subjecting you to torture, um, then it means that we really have to tackle this problem from from we really have to go like you know into into our, our schools and and try to you know enlighten our, our people. Um, then there's something that I'm really passionate about, um, which is obviously um, you know, accurate representation of LGBT people in, in the media. Because prior to even, I mean, prior to us telling our own stories as a, as a community, you know, the stories you'd see there are stories like, you know, oh, these people need to be cured, or these people are, are not okay, or, you know, something bad happened to, excuse me, something bad happened to this person because this person is gay. And, you know, like always tying the sexual orientation of someone to a negative thing, you know, and or saying, you know, queer people are rapists and all kinds of rubbish, you know. Um, and we just realized as a, as a community that, okay, if these people are not going to tell our stories or tell our stories well, then we have to be the ones to tell our stories, right? And so, um, so there has to be sort of more of that and, and not just for community members alone, but like for editors, you know, for people who write, people who, who are, who are, people who have blogs, you know, because that's where a lot of people get their news from, um, mm -hmm. for people who, who just, um, who are just in, in positions where they share a lot of information, so influencers and things like that, people who have the power to shape people's opinions about things, you know, um, there has to be like more training um, um, towards towards that. Um, then the, I feel like there also needs to be more commitment from like the government. Like, as I said, even though there hasn't been you know, any no one has actually gone to jail because of that law. But I mean, when you have a situation where the law exists and you you defend the you actually defend the law, you have a situation where you now leave the community vulnerable to a whole lot of things, even if you're not actually 
nobody's actually going to jail, but then there are like social repercussions, you know, for for all of all of those those for I guess that kind of negligence or that kind of non-action, you know. Um, then there also needs to be like a, a like outright ban on conventional therapy, because as I explained to you, um, not good. The experiences are not good. You know, you know, even looking at my own personal experience to other people's and experiences that I know of, you know, even the fraudulent things that happen in the name of conversion, um, you know, all of these things are happening and people are legit being abused people are being you know taken advantage of people are being used you know and it's just there's research on this there's a whole lot of things you know um and i feel even now speaking about it i think what will even be very powerful is to you know make you know a, a, a movie or something that actually shows this um what what that looks like you know, that shows the impact of of conversion therapy on people's lives, you know, like real people. You know, so I so, so yeah, so but that that needs to happen. And I feel like maybe if there is more conversation around it, especially in Nigeria, maybe these things might move along a bit a bit more. Um yeah, so I I spoke about um, training of law enforcement officers and healthcare providers. You know, because there are, there are stories and there are things that have happened where people, you know, people go to to the hospital maybe because they have maybe an infection or they have something else, and then you know they can't say to the doctor, "Oh, I I only have sex with men or I only have sex with women," because they will out you like legit call the police, you know, or they will treat you. Some kind of way, like they yell at you, or sometimes outright non-treatment. Like they, they, they say, "No, you know, you, you deserve this thing that's happening to you because how dare you do this when you should be doing this?" You know, and and so a lot of people don't have access to healthcare because of these kinds of attitudes, or they will just start preaching for you, like right there, instead of focusing on your health problem. Or the issue that brought you to the hospital, they start telling you about Jesus, right? They start telling you about how um, how what you're doing is bad and how you're going to hell. You know, can you imagine that like, you have a medical problem and then your doctor is telling you this, right? So it's crazy. And then, um, yeah, like you know, um, I mentioned earlier that I, I I'm, I'm in court right now and because the Corporate Affairs Commission refused to register um, an organization that I tried to register. And so um, there hasn't, they're not, actually there are only two cases um, that, are, that, that are of this nature that are challenging this same Section 10 of the Same Sex Marriage Prohibition Act. And um, so if, if more people, I feel like if, because I, I know that this, violation like the violations arising from from the SSMPA occur on a daily basis, right? I know that for for a fact. So but the, the thing about it, people are not willing to come forward or to pursue cases in court for a variety of reasons, right? Some people are not out to their families, so they don't want they don't want their families to know. Or some people are some people don't want that attention. Mm -hmm. You know, some people some people don't um some some people don't believe that they're gonna get justice, right? They don't think that the law or the court system systems work. So they'd rather just said so privately, pay whatever they need to pay and just move on with, with their with their lives, you know. Um so I feel like if if we're able to really um if, if we're able to find a way to to sort of challenge these laws, you know, with more cases, I feel like some things might change because at least we would be testing the system to see if it actually works or not, right? Um, so yeah, so this is, these are just, um, I don't know, I've been talking for a while and I'm kind of, I feel like I've given you an, 
an earful and um but anyway um as i said you know most of this if not all of them stem from homophobia um they they're fueled by the same sex my prohibition act because people, people have taken laws into their hands and they feel like okay this thing i'm doing is the right thing and they believe that with all their hearts you know so it obviously um affects um you know it's obviously reflected there in the in the numbers and then i also felt like there is a, a gap between what queer people need in Nigeria and what the law says. So where else do you see a lot of you see a lot of violations and um and negative impact that's fueled by this law, you know? So it's like and and I know that there are there are some there are some instances where there is there's an affirmative law. So there there's a like a law that, that protects queer people, but then society has not changed its attitudes, right? And case in point, what's happening in, in South Africa, you know, where there are the legal protections for, for um, LGBT folks, but then people are being, lesbians are being killed, or there's um, there's a, a, what they call corrective rape, um, or just, you know, murder of trans people, you know. So whereas in, in Nigeria, we have a situation where, where, um, there is a sort of like a uh, there's a negative law, but then you know, and we also have a situation where people are feeding off of that law, whereas it's leaving a gap of needs, you know. Okay, so who's going to who's who's going to look out for this particular section of society? Who's going to care about the violations? Who's going to care about how people live their lives? Like, do they have access to, to education? You know, can they go to school? Can do they have clean water? Do they have access to healthcare? You know, do they have a roof over their heads? Can they keep jobs regardless or and yeah, regardless of their sexual orientation or, or gender identity, right? And so that's one of the reasons why I believe that the same sex marriage prohibition act needs to be repealed. Um, and honestly, I'm gonna be honest, I don't think that the government is going to do it. I've said that multiple times. I don't think it, I don't think that there's a will to do it. I feel like Maybe eventually, when there's nothing left of, of the law, they might say, okay. But I feel like little challenges to sections of the law, in my opinion, will be much more impactful or much more, will be more of a stronger strategy, you know, rather than depending on, 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 um, on the government to, to do it. And I also feel, again, that, um, you know, we really need to, you know, um, um, intensify efforts for social inclusion. So continue telling stories, continue. It doesn't necessarily need to be just film. It can be, it, as I said, it can be podcasts. There are quite a few podcasts out there that, um, that you know, talk about um, the lived experiences of queer people, um, you know, especially Nigerian podcasts. Um, there, there, there are more public shows that are that are exploring the topic of same-sex relationships and homosexuality publicly um, in Nigeria now. Yeah, so it's 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 a conversation that is gaining traction. Um, it's been gaining traction for a while, and I, and I feel like it's only going to grow because that's just the nature of life, I guess. <laughs> Um, yeah, and obviously I, I can't, you know, emphasize like, the work that's been done on ground to, to make sure that these things happen, um, all the people that risk their lives, that, you know, on the forefront doing, doing the, the hard work, I feel like those people need to be supported in any way, shape, or form. Um, yeah, so I think I'll stop there for now. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I think I'll stop now and then I will share the link. Um, yeah, I'll share the link in, in the in the chat now. The link to the to the um, teaser. All right. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Pamela, for, for your insights. Really engaging. It's a very contentious subject, and the way that you're putting it and the way that you are doing it is quite innovative. And thank you for sharing uh, those uh, perspectives and the work that you are doing. We are really grateful for that. Uh, as Pamela pointed out, if we have got any questions for, for her, it's either you put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask uh, a question. So thank you everyone for this um, uh, event. And I thank, thank you, um, Pamela, for that um, really instructive and insightful uh, presentation. Uh, my what I intend to say is not um, it's like a question, but it's also an observation, if you like. Uh, you you know narrated so many instances, so many say so many things uh, concerning the faith of um, LGBTQ plus people in Nigeria, their experiences and their difficulties and they are facing. So, but this way, what I would like to say, observe, or issue a question I would like to raise with you uh, is the respect of um, uh, the mistreatment of um, homosexuality in Nigeria. I mean, um, is the mistreatment related to the status of the person in society, or is the mistreatment uh, gen generally applicable to uh, people of uh, this uh, category. Uh, why I'm raising this, uh, asking this question is that um, there is this perception uh, in Nigeria that uh, prominent people in society, politicians, um, economic um, heavyweights in Nigeria, that some of them are actually, actually uh, involved uh, in homosexuality, not all of them, some of them, highly powerful people in Nigeria. And, and you know, you talked, uh, you talked about uh, known act, uh, state actors, um, uh, uh, you know, working outside the law to you know, pose a um, difficult uh, situation for um, LGBTQ plus people. So with these powerful people in Nigeria, those known, known state actors you are talking about, may not even have access to their house or where they stay or their, you know, their lifestyle and stuff like that. So they may not even have uh, that opportunity to harass or, or oppress them. If I should use this, uh, I don't want to be more specific, but if I should use one example, Bob Risky is well known in Nigeria and uh, she dramatizes uh, her homosexuality and the status, and she's not afraid of that in Nigeria. Uh, Bob Risky, which I know you know too. So in summary, is the mistreatment or harassment or whatever you call it based on status or is it generally ap applicable because of, I know that so many people in Nigeria are not really almost untouchable and they are involved in those stuff. So I would, like, I would, I would appreciate your comments on this. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I, I, I just, I mean, I'll answer your question, but I wanted to say that, you know, um, the sexual orientation of a person is not something that somebody is involved in. Like that's just that's the way they are, right? Like or that's the way we are. Um, but I I feel that um, status has a lot to to do with it. And when I say status, I mean um, financial status or financial privilege or um, any other kind of privilege that sort of protects you from or does not expose you to a lot of things that other other people that don't have those privileges are, are exposed to. You know, for instance, I, I give an example of someone who lives in maybe one of these face me, I face you kind of community, small community arrangements where um you know someone your your neighbor can just like break into your house or just walk into your house and and start shouting or hey i've got them or blah 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 and then you know and then anything could happen it could be more violence it could be you losing your housing it could be anything right or you just getting the beating of your life 
but there are people that don't live in those kinds of arrangements people who who live in gated estates people who who live in their own houses obviously nobody can just break into your house right maybe because you have the security guard or you have a police person at the you know at the gates so you're not exposed to that so i feel like it's it's a matter of of it i feel like status and privilege has a lot to do with it um has a lot to do with the kinds of violations that people suffer you know because obviously if you are not someone that uses public transport for instance right if you if you drive your own car and you don't necessarily rely on public transportation to go anywhere, you're not going to be exposed to people who are more likely to harass you like that. Or, or if you go somewhere and you, have, you drive a nice car, people will just accord you more respect, even if you are doing something that they don't think is cool, but because they think that you have money, they will sort of turn a blind eye to it or they will just act in ways that will make you give them money right so so yes status has a lot to 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 do with this whole thing also and it's very unfortunate because nigeria is a very classist society in in, in my opinion where you know yeah it ought not to be so but that's, mm -hmm. that's what we have thank you thank you Thank you for that. Uh, iPhone 12 mini. <laughs> oh, it's you. I <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi. Thank you very much, Pamela. I, I have two questions of curiosity and then um, one like more uh, substantial. Uh, the, the two questions are because you're talking about storytelling and I want to ask uh, questions about storytellers and how stories are told. One is just a couple of days ago, uh, you know, Chimimanda Adichie has come out full transphobic, but this has been going on, as you know. And so I wanted to understand how, uh, you know, the local the, uh, or the Nigerian community, the Nigerian queer community in Nigeria uh, receives, uh, you know, uh, her her position because most of what she says, at, at least she claims, draws on, you know, the African feminist sensibility and, you know, all, all, all of that. And she's a person with such a big platform. So yeah. um, how is she received and perceived, uh, in, you know, in the, in the local community and what kind of damage does, uh, you know, uh, her platform drew on on the community and the second one is just a like a i think the last season of sex uh, sex education um i don't know if you have watched it but I, I i i'd like to think you have and many people do consume that netflix series um and there's eric uh the nigerian uh, not Nigerian, but you know, he kind of goes back to Nigeria. One of the protagonists in the in the series, he goes back to Nigeria as a queer person for a, a wedding with his mom and his people. And then there is a night out, you know, where he's mingling with the Nigerian queer community. And it was, I mean, for for us outsiders, it was really nice to to watch that kind of uh, representation. But there was, I, I know also there was like a social media uproar about like how that scene was romanticized and how it doesn't represent the, you know, the local uh, reality in its entirety and its complexity. So, but how was, so if people spoke about sex education and the return of Eric um, in Nigeria, how did people talk about that? These are the two questions about in relation, you know, in relation to storytelling and social change. Um, the other question I have is just a couple of years ago, there was, uh, you know, NSARS protest in Nigeria and um, there were really striking images coming out of uh, Nigeria at the time where we saw queer people um, took part in, 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 the, um, in this anti-SARS movement at the time. And so I was wondering what, um, you know, when we when we talk about activism, when we talk about local queer activism in Nigeria or elsewhere on the continent, how involved are uh, uh, queer folks in the broader 
process of social change, you know, beyond and above issues that immediately concern um, how involved uh, uh, as a community to bring about broader social change so that, you know, the world can be a better place. Um, um, yeah, I think um, these are the, you know, the few points that I would like to hear you reflect on. Thank you. Okay, very interesting. Thank you so much for that. So I'm going to start with the last thing that you asked, which was about um, how connected are we um, as a movement to other movements um, in terms of um, what we're doing to bring about, you know, um, more holistic or more or wider social change. Um, so I, I mean, from experience and from obviously past knowledge, I know that um, the movement as a whole has not really done a good job in in um, in liaising with other other um, groups, you know, in in terms of working, you know. So how well are LGBT rights activists or the community in general working with the women's rights groups, right? And it hasn't always been, um, it, it hasn't always been ideal. And there are a variety of reasons for that, you know, because like Chimamanda, you have the TERFs, the trans exclusive mm. rights, um, trans exclusive um, um, feminists, you know, people who, feminists who say they're feminists, but they don't believe in trans inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of them that exist in, 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 in Nigeria. And so um, there are also um, women's rights groups, for instance, um, that don't that, that don't believe that LGBT rights are human rights or that mm -hmm. or that LGBT rights um, has anything to do with whatever it is that they are fighting for, you know. So and then there's also uh, in the community where people didn't really see the need for all of that, but I think that as the world has moved and people have become more enlightened, we see that our struggles are connected, right? Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. there is a need for us to be able to find commonalities and you know fight or fight together in our struggles. So, there's been a lot of um, um, efforts to sort of create that intersectionality, you know, where it's like okay. Yes, especially with the NSAS movement, right? So, so um, the queer people were very, um, were very vocal, very mm. present. Me myself, I was there, um, and even the the director of Ife We Aiju was also. Um, she was actually pictured, you know, carrying a placard, and there are people that were carrying like pride flags. And people were like attacked, you know, because especially, I mean, physically, physically attacked in the protest, like on the protest grounds. And then like even on Twitter, where people were, because there was a, there was an organization called Femco um, that was kind of spearheading the, they were kind of like the lead coordinators of the protest, right? So they were coordinating food, security, ambulance, Things mm. like that for for the protests in Lagos and around parts of Nigeria, and so when they tweeted in support of of um of of queer people that were that were advocating, you know, during the protest, you know, they got a lot of backlash. The backlash was so bad that they had to delete their own tweets. Mm. So so you know just so that they can take the heat off of them themselves. You know, even though that, even though we know that there are queer people within the Femco movement, you know that uh, I mean, you know, so so it, it just it just shows you the kind of terrain that people have to operate in, and mm -hmm. the kinds of things that that people are, are exposed to. But but yes, um, there there has been more um more deliberate efforts to sort of create that in intersectionality that like, okay what we're actually fighting for is police brutality or fighting against police brutality right and everybody experiences police brutality whether you're mm -hmm. gay or straight or whatever right like everybody experiences that and 
it's not just a struggle that affects just one person. But I don't think that people are or we're at a place where they're ready to see that, you know. Um, but at the same time, when we're having um, like you know, say the symposium, the the human rights um, symposium, which is a yearly event, um, sometimes um, I, I say we because I've worked with TS to organize some of these events. Um, and we've reached out to other organizations like the University of Lagos, for instance, to to be part of of that um, of that um, of, of that event. You know, um, so so there's there's been more deliberate effort to kind of work with more women's rights groups, um, work with brother brother um, sort of build um, coalitions. You know, there isn't like any major coalition now, but you know, there is work being done on the ground to kind of um and hopefully get to a point where we where these movements are able to intersect and intersect meaningfully to bring about more uh, more wider impact or more wider change where you know um someone from a traditional women's rights groups group can see that okay if lgbt people are being discriminated against it also affects her and if an LGBT, lgbt people can see that if women's rights groups are uh, uh, um, discriminated against it also affects us you know so there's that effort that's 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 happening um and um to answer the question about chimamanda so i already mentioned that you know she's obviously She's not someone that believes in in the rights of trans people, or she's yes, yeah, she she has her own views. I'm I'm not really a I don't I don't agree with her about uh, on on those issues. Um, and I haven't read what she said recently. I have I know I know what she said like some time ago about how trans women are not women and things like that. But I haven't read what she said now. So I don't know if I can if I can Reiter respond to that. Pardon? No, she just reiterated what she said. I mean, I was oh. I'm really <laughs> interested in how you know people on the ground perceive what she says and what she does. Yeah, so I mean, like within the movement, there are people that that don't that are turfs are turfs as well, right? They also don't believe in trans rights, or so they don't really. Um, really advocate for trans people either so there's that group of people but i think that the wider majority don't agree with her because um obviously the 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 trans people here too you know there's there's a there's a budding trans community um here here in in, in in nigeria and we can't say that we are advocating for the community as a whole when our trans brothers and sisters are um, are you know um, so yes, there are people that 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 support her and think that she's right, but then the, the majority of people don't agree with her community wise, don't agree with her. And obviously I've not spoken to every community member, but I mean the few that I've engaged with um or I've, that I've heard their views on on, on this issue, um has been more of you no. Know, and even when she said it, when she said those things before, it was the same thing. You know the same arguments coming up. You know, um, thanks. I've seen the the, the link. Um, mm -hmm. So and then I also wanted to talk about um, Eric. So mm -hmm. that that episode that episode was um, so when they were trying to um, write the episode, they actually reached out to the director of of Ife Uyaidu, oh. and she yeah she contributed to 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 that whole thing. <laughs> um okay. and um yes you know so okay a lot of people have the opinion that there is that they have they are yes there are happy endings when it comes to queer people here but they are not that many and so when you see when when people see um a film or anything that sort of depicts this happy ending it's like oh we don't think that's accurate, right? Because that's not the reality of a lot of people. But again, I, I also believe that, as I said, 
film doesn't necessarily need to stop at showing where things are now. They can mm -hmm. also show you what things what can be in the future. Mm -hmm. So, so I didn't necessarily see anything. I'm quite frankly, I'm I'm really ready for a happy ending. You know, I, <laughs> I'm I'm really really tired of. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you very much. This is um, uh, I think um, you've touched on everything that I, I I said. Thank you, thank you very much. And it's interesting to hear that because from the social media appro, you would think uh, you know, it's just um, people from Europe going and doing everything without really consulting, uh, um. Uh, you know, queer community members and activists on on the ground. That's how it came across. Even when when we know when we read the reaction uh, about or against Eric and that happy ending and all all of that beautiful scene, I, I I did enjoy watching it. It doesn't also like you said, it doesn't have to represent uh, everything. A film can only do as much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. You're <laughs> welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll go to Mitterrand and then Sama, uh, so that uh, Pamela answers the questions right away. Mitterrand, please. Um, okay, I, I, I wanted to ask a very quick question, but before then, I wanted to inform the House that uh, my PI, Professor Keja, was or is in a hiring committee today, so that's why he couldn't come. I also want to thank, thank Pamela for coming and to thank uh, all of those who were involved in, in uh, putting this debate up. I thank Professor Toko for giving us the opportunity to actually organize it and show ourselves a uh, gift and Isabella. Uh, I thank you for you know, your cooperation and all your works. Uh, the question I have is, is very simple. Um, it's just curiosity on my part because um, uh, on one hand, I can see that things are kind of shifting in Nigeria in terms of what, you know, LGBTQI people can do and, you know, the gatherings that they can put up. You know, I know that uh, BC and me, for example, there are times he comes to Nigeria and he has events that he actually announces beforehand. Uh, I, don't, I don't think this used to be the case. Uh, I'm, I would say... Sometimes I call it progress, but at the same time, when I see the vitriol on, on Twitter sometimes or on Instagram, uh, again, I'm like, have we really made progress? So somehow I don't know which is which, you know, I, I don't know what you think about this, uh, Pamela. Thank you. Yeah, okay. like it's a very interesting question and observation because it's actually it is true. That's that's what happens. Um, but I also feel like in, even if you know that's the reaction that he gets, it's still progress in some way, even if it's not even if it's not progress all all round, right? It's still progress in some way, just for the mere fact that. He can even do that, that he can even come to Nigeria, that's one. That he can organize events, that's true. That he can organize events publicly, that's three. <laughs> that he can announce it is four. That people are even talking about it is five. Like those are not things that could happen in, you know, maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Uh -huh. You know, but okay. those are things, but those are things that are happening now. So in as much as it's not exactly where we want it to be, but it's still something that is, I mean, they're just, I, I believe very much in celebrating small wins, no matter how small those wins are or how insignificant they might appear. But I feel like those things lay the foundation for more things to happen. And yeah, that so, they do count. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's my take. Okay, thank you. Tama, please. Hello, thank you so much, Pamela, for the amazing um, presentation. And um, thank you also, Doko, Isabel, and Gift for putting this together. This is amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. So um, my question is um, regarding the ethical consideration when doing the storytelling. Um, let me just elaborate a little bit on this. Uh, the queer movement in Sudan is 
working underground, of course, because of the challenges and the security threats from the state and the society. So how can we document? How can we um, do the oral history documentation and the storytelling without putting uh, the queer individuals and activists um, on risk? And um, also, uh, how can we do this without exposing the queer uh, movement strategies? Uh, here, I'm not only talking about the consent. Um, uh, this is, I think, this is more complicated than just the consent. Uh, it would be great if you can uh, share your experience and insights on this, Pamela. Thank you so much. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, you know, this is something that I really struggled with when we were doing, um, when we were doing um, Under the Rainbow, you know, the documentary. Because initially, the plan was to have um, about three or four um, queer Nigerian women, you know, just sort of tell their stories and then tie it together um, as as a whole. But then um, nobody wanted to wanted to come on camera uh, to show their faces or to tell their stories and things like that. And it was a it was a challenge. Um, it was something that we had to deal with because. The whole point of visibility, right, is to be visible, right? So it's, it kind of felt like you're defeating the purpose if people are not visible. Like you can literally have anybody just say something like, when you're able to, to, to see someone or to identify a particular story or to kind of, you know, put a, a face to it, you know, it, it's more powerful than when you have people speaking behind a mask or, or something like that. That's my personal belief, right? But then that's not, a lot of people don't have that opportunity or don't, or are not willing to kind of put themselves out there like that. And that's, I think that's that's the question that, that you have. So my whole thing is, I mean, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be just in, it doesn't have to be like real life, like how do I say it? It doesn't have to be like someone telling their own story directly. It can be something else. It can be, I mean, maybe if people don't want to show their faces, it can be a podcast, you know, or they can have an, an alias, you know, like a, like a different name or something that doesn't really identify them or people that are afraid of being identified or afraid that maybe someone might, there might be backlash or something like that, you know. Um, so there are other ways that you can have podcasts, you can express through art, you know, um, through visual arts. It doesn't necessarily have to be just, you know, about talking or writing or speaking. You can tell so many things through art. Um, it can be photography, you know, even if you're, even if you're, you're taking pictures of people from the side or from, you know, from the back or like, you know, from, you know, just like, you know. It, it, there are so many ways that you can express without necessarily having to put people at risk or people that don't want that, you know. Um, yeah, and then and then I think also um, you mentioned something about without exposing the strategies of the community, which I think is very very important because if the state knows what you're doing, they can act against you. Which was kind of like my my, which was almost what happened to us, right? So when we were uh, producing Ife, we knew that Ife wasn't going to be shown in the in the in the theaters in Nigeria because the census board wouldn't approve it, right? Um, so we we never planned for it to show there, but when the poster came out and the teaser came out. There was, I mean, it gained so much traction, it was everywhere. So the census board had to comment on it, right? And they started saying, oh, we are it's against our culture and blah, blah, blah. And then they threatened to arrest me and, <laughs> and other members of my of my group and the director and all of that, you know. Um, but we 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 didn't we already knew that we had a platform that we were going to show the film on. So we didn't necessarily need permission from them because they don't regulate that platform, right? So so that was our own strategy um, that we used to bypass 
all of those things. And and that now the film can be seen by anybody anywhere in, in the world without regulation or someone looking over looking over the platform to say, no, you can't show this and you can't show that. So um so yeah, so to answer your question, um we people um okay, sorry, my app my airport died. Sorry. So it, it can be it can be different telling stories through other, like, you know, maybe a film or, or, or something like that, or, or through podcasts or art, or through, there are also um, anthologies, you know, and, you know, that, that gather stories of, of people in, 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 a, in, a, in a book. I know some people don't like to read, but a lot of people should be reading. Um, but, but that's also one, one way to do it. Um, but yeah, but I think it's possible for you to do that without necessarily exposing, like, okay, this is kind of where we are going to focus on as a movement, you know. And I think it's important to also think like ahead, like to 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 anticipate what the state might say or what they might be thinking, and then plan ahead of that, you know, to say, okay, in the event that they do this or they say this, this is what we're going to do next. So to have like plan A, B, C, D, E, because that's just the nature of the kind of work that we're doing, you know? So that's my two cents. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Pamela, for, for the responses. Uh, I think in the very interest of time, uh, we have to come to the end of the session. Uh, from me, I would like to thank you for taking the time to be with us and give us the talk and uh, sharing your knowledge as as, as uh, comfortably as that. Uh, I'll have to hand over to Professor Top Baime to say the last words for the session. So your timing is, is perfect. I was about to, uh, to leave. Thank you so much, uh, Pamela, and thanks for yeah, a very open and honest uh, account of uh, the struggle, you know, and um, we look forward to hearing more uh, about your work uh, and hope that in the future we can work together maybe to create a different narrative uh, in this area of uh, human rights protection. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah, thank, thank you, Pamela. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.